The daughter of Gustav Holst was a composer in her own right. I'm the classical nerd, and today we're talking about Imogen Holst. Imogen was born into the Holst family in 1907 and was to be their only child. The Holst family was long involved in the musical arts, and at that point Gustav was working hard to make his name more as composer than provincial trombonist and choir director. Gustav wasn't amongst the avant-garde, and the piano pieces he taught his daughter tended toward the Baroque and Classical eras. Imogen's schooling was fairly average for her time and social class, and she began boarding school at age 10. She had weird terms for describing musical things. Music theory, for instance, she referred to as ripping. Regardless of what she called it, she was good enough in the subject to win herself various prizes. She studied violin and piano and quite enjoyed dancing as well. In fact, she was composer and choreographer to a small ballet production at her school when she was 13. Dance appeared to be as much, if not more, of a love than music but she was turned down when she applied for a school that specialized in dance because they didn't think she had the right physical fortitude. As it turned out, they were right. Three years later, on the way to a promising career in the piano, she developed basically deep vein thrombosis, but in her arm and not, like, life-threatening. Gustav had long suffered from neuritis in his arm, which hindered his ability to orchestrate, but Imogen's wasn't inherited, it was just a weird and bad stroke of fate. But there were always new ways to be active in her ambitions, and she even joined the English Folk Dance Society, whose members included Percy Granger and the late George Butterworth. Imogen's education led her to the Royal College of Music, just like her father. When she got there, she was immediately noticed as a prodigy on the conductor's podium, before turning her attention more towards composition. Her graduation project was a piece called The Unfortunate Traveler, scored for brass band, as stereotypically English as you're ever going to get. But she was not a fan of this piece. In fact, many years later, when she discovered the original manuscript, she thought of it as basically the embodiment of her failures, and she wanted it burned. She had extremely high standards for herself in this way, and these high standards extended to her father's work when she was put in charge of preparing a retrospective of his pieces. No rose-colored glasses for her, which really helped her in a field where bias would be understandable. After graduation, she toured around Europe on scholarship money and ended up with a mixed opinion on continental music making for her trouble. She couldn't quite understand Italian singing, and in Vienna, she got bored of the concert programs because it was just the same couple of composers over and over until it got stale. She returned, bereft of money, with a new appreciation for London's musical life and began teaching and conducting and accompanying and arranging her way to financial solvency. With the whole name attached, Imogen had quite the chip on her shoulder, and since her father had risen to be the most prominent Holst, that chip carried some extra weight. Even if she felt her compositional skills to be lacking, she decided to carry on the tradition as a musicologist, if nothing else. After her father died in 1934, she prepared his biography. This biography, which established her credibility in the field, was published four years later. Contemporaneously, she did some digging and arranged some pieces by a very obscure English composer named Pelham Humphrey. Now, this love of early music is something that would continue throughout the rest of her life. Decades later, she'd publish a retrospective of the life of William Byrd. But for now, her interest in this kind of really obscure material attracted the attention of the composer Benjamin Britten, about which more later. After a while working these odd jobs, Imogen wanted her career to be much more professional, and she began the process of severing her ties in London so she would have the free time to start a career on the continent. But it was only two months into this trip that World War II seemed pretty much imminent, so she came back to London. Upon returning to England, she was put to work as essentially a music ambassador. Her job? Travel around to keep morale high as much as possible. It was a hands-on and highly demanding job, but it was one that brought people and communities together. It was a crash course in organizing things that she passed with flying colors. After two years, she reached a point of clinical exhaustion, and while recuperating in Dartington Hall in the southwest of England, she quit her post in order to work there. This was initially under the auspices of having a much more relaxed daily schedule, but eventually what she took on there ballooned from teaching one course to a bunch of young women to basically being the music director. She had her own orchestra. Her performers 
sucked at first, but through her constant dedication to improving them and pushing them beyond what they thought were their limits, she was able to get enough people together to play box mass in B minor. Even noted composers who would drop by, such as Paul Hindemith, were fascinated by her very unique hands-on approach. Despite all this activity, it was less than what she was doing, and she actually had the time to write some pieces again, ranging from small-scale wind works to full-blown choral pieces. While she was formally trained, her approach to her students was that of learning by doing. She also worked on occasion as Benjamin Britten's editor. She left her job at Dartington after a while, slowly severing ties, and she explored everything from Renaissance madrigals to Indian music. She still assisted Britain on occasion, but was never in a formal capacity until 1952, when she was hired to take over the Aldeburgh Festival, something that Britain was instrumental in creating, but wasn't particularly run all that well. They needed an expert. At the time, Imogen told Britain that she preferred working with notes more than people, but her friends knew that, out of loyalty, she would help them without any monetary recourse, despite being pretty much strapped for cash most of her life. Imogen held Britain's music in extremely high regard, and assisted with the creation of parts and short scores for his pieces, and she even helped out with the orchestration of pieces with looming deadlines. She served in this capacity for 12 years, before acknowledging that preservation of her father's legacy had to supersede her assisting one of the greatest British composers of all time, someone she saw as the rebirth of English music and also possibly a secondary father figure. She continued her involvement with the Aldeburgh Festival for over a decade to come, but this meant that she had more free time that she could use to compose. Several large commissions rolled in pretty much right after she quit her assistantship gig. Her dedication to early music did not wean, as she promoted it through her own efforts as well as the Aldeburgh Festival. She was also known for walking along the beach even when it was extremely cold. She told an interviewer that it was like having champagne without the hangover. In the later years of Britain's life, Imogen held much more sway over the direction of the Aldeburgh Festival. But after Britain passed away in 1976, Imogen really decided that it was time for her to move on as well. And when she was 70, the next year, she quit. The later years of Imogen's life were devoted to editing and republishing her father's music, as well as conducting the music of her father and herself. She began suffering from angina, which slowed her considerable energy. She passed away in 1984, two years after her final major composition, a work whose maturity, in her own words, finally made her a real composer. Imogen's musical life was varied, taking on a whole bunch of different projects and doing a whole bunch of different things, but there's only so many hours in a day, and the time that she dedicated to doing these other things would often come out of time that she would otherwise spend composing. Thus, periods of high-intensity work would fall between large stretches with barely a note written. She was known in musical circles, but it just wasn't for composition. As such, most of her work remains unpublished, and it doesn't help that a lot of her works are for amateurs and or choirs. While she began her career writing in a very safe English pastoral countryside idiom, her techniques expanded to include such things as synthetic scales. Her commitment to so many musical activities was a result of her belief that music was in everyone, and that she, if she did her job, could have a hand in bringing that about. And without her tireless efforts, the Hulse name might have easily fallen into obscurity.